I suggest we just get uh, get started. I'll just do a brief introduction and then uh, we'll get right right on started with uh, with the webinar. Uh, it's fantastic to see you all here. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar for um, that we do uh, as Scrum facilitators about forecasting performance. We've got Andy recently joining Scrum facilitators as a professional Scrum trainer as well uh, from the UK together with Steve Krabs, uh, which is really awesome. So we're really growing as a group and as a brand, which is fantastic. Um, and one of the one of the specialities or what is the skills, the unique traits that Andy has or special interest maybe is um, uh, is Kanban. And uh, he's also a pro Kanban trainer. So you may, you know, whatever I leave out, you can uh, you can add that well when I, when I'm <laughs> on Andy. Um, so we, we give all kind of um, uh, Scrum.org training um, and we're all Scrum Masters and product owners and uh, consultants in our daily lives as well. So we know what it feels like to be a Scrum Master or a product owner or all that kind of stuff. Um, and we like to do a lot for with and for the community. So we build products and we not just do training, uh, but also these kind of meetups and stuff like that. So if you stick around in the uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll share uh, a link with you to, if you're not in there yet, to our Slack community, which will provide you access to um, a lot of more information and each other, which is, I think, awesome. So um, Andy, I would say let's, uh, let's start. Cool. Um, hopefully audio is going okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the first majority of this is going to be just me telling a little story uh, and then we'll get into a little bit about that kind of how that impacts and some some of the metrics potentially i mean if you've got questions just, just shout them out throughout i'm i'm kind of um uh jasper jasper and i were talking ahead of this and he was saying uh he was trying to get me to do some stuff and i was saying look i'm not normal in the way i present I'm not a normal presenter. Um, uh, so if you've seen me talk before, uh, you'll know that I'm not normal. <laughs> I'm not a normal presenter. Anyway, so well, 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 uh, Andy, uh, that I forgot to mention, we are recording this. So that's a good thing. Uh, so you can watch it later and show your friends. Uh, but do also notice that if you have questions or if you don't want to be in it video wise, we'll probably just uh, record Andy ultimately and, and the slides, of course. Uh, but if you want to make sure when you're talking and you put your camera off, then we'll make sure that you know you're not going to be in the video, just audio, just um, to have that said. Cool. Okay, we're ready. We're going to roll. Uh, I realised um, it's my fourth year as a professional scrum trainer. Uh, kind of very very soon. It's kind of it's been a kind of a wild ride, and, and probably about oh god, what was it? Two or two, three years. It must be over three years ago. Um, Scrum all created this class called the Professional Scrum and Kanban class, and um, uh, it immediately captured me. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I kind of want to get into you know how it all fits together. But what you'll recognize um, uh, when we start talking about Professional Scrum and Kanban is um, a lot of what you are doing, have been doing as Scrum Masters, really fits in that whole package in that whole collective of Kanban with Scrum. There's just a few extra little bits you need to be taking care of. But you know, this is why they're so highly complementary together. Um, so this talk I've done quite a few times and it follows a little story and the story is about um, me trying to overcome uh, what used to be, I mean, it was it was at the time uh, uh, one of the toughest uh, UK races. Uh, it's now, there's obviously now lots of ultras and all these other things, but it's still, I think it is still up there with one of the, one of the toughest UK races anyway. Um, and we'll get into that. Um, what I'd like to do is ask a question. Um, oh, this is the Scrum Facilitator. I, I, I'll, I'll just kind of pretend I knew this was coming. Uh, look, there's me on the top left, <laughs> combined with some other people. What this means is um, uh, I've joined this amazing collective of other Scrum trainers, and it is an amazing collective. They are they are brilliant to work with, very chatty, and that's a bit of an in joke, but but incredibly passionate about what they do, um, and and kind of spreading a little bit more across the globe. Um, and the purpose of joining uh, the Scrum Facilitators is to just provide that extra um, uh, and have that extra bit of professionalism along with what we deliver as part of Scrum Trainers. And also, do you know what? It's so good working as part of a team. And you'll all recognize that 
regardless of what you do once you find a great team to work with you will you will absolutely recognize that so yeah i'm more than more than happy and absolutely stoked to be here um uh, they've just got to get used to the way i work and i don't think they're quite <laughs> looking at me he's like i'm not used to that yet okay so um i want a show of hands or some feedback how many people on this little webcast can predict the future oh we got one we got eric eric can predict the future <laughs> Well, I'm Eric. predicting I'm going to have dinner in an hour. You're going to predict. So, well, you're probably you're probably using a deterministic uh, pattern to predict the future, right? So, so uh, deterministic. We're kind of a little bit jumping ahead and early and probably off topic. But anyway, it's kind of interesting. Deterministic uh, forecasting is saying based upon uh, evidence that we know is absolutely true 100 percent the future is going to look like x right and so eric probably has dinner at a regular time that is deterministic whereas something like the weather is very much probabilistic right we think based upon patterns and we think based upon uh, certainty and uncertainty but we can't right so i, I maybe i'll to reword this how many people can predict the lottery numbers the winning lottery numbers right you know nobody uh yeah, <laughs> He's probably written a, a computer program for it. Uh, how many people on here use story points? Go on, be honest. Okay, Helen, Helen's been brave. Eric's been brave. Uh, okay, Jose. Oh, is that Jose or Jose? Uh, how do you put it? say it? He's trying oh, to find the mute button. This is okay. <laughs> Both ways of Jose, butchering okay. your name are absolutely fine. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, they forced uh, me to, yeah. <laughs> so can anybody tell me why story points oh we skipped one why story points were created why isn't that showing there we are how can anybody tell me the origin of story points to move us away from units of time uh kind of okay yes and no okay so um story points originate um I've been digging a lot into this subject. Story points originated from extreme programming. Um, uh, Ron Jeffries was part of the three people who created extreme programming. Um, and what they were doing at the time is they were using ideal days as a way of forecasting the future. So they were using this idea that it would take uh, what used to be called in project management man days, you know, it's like people days or ideal days or whatever you want to call it now. But they were using the concept of time. And what they realized is actually when they were saying three days, it was probably taking six. OK, so um, they created this system. Uh, they created this system called load factor or a load factor on the estimates they were providing. Um, and that was basically any estimate they provided, they plus three. Somehow in the kind of uh, the, somehow they kind of realized, well, OK, so this is sort of obfuscating the real purpose of providing a forecast. And they came up with this strategy around creating arbitrary point system, which then got turned into the Fibonacci sequence, which then got turned into this huge movement. Um, and, and kind of going back to the original point of that is, well, they've been created uh, to serve a purpose to basically say, we don't know, but we think. I mean, Eric came, actually, Eric, you've really helped me with this talk because Eric's <laughs> perfectly demonstrated the difference between uh, uh, deterministic thinking, whereby we've done something before, we know absolutely it's going to happen, and probabilistic thinking, where we think something could happen, but we're just not sure. The large majority of the work we do in complex system and complex work is probabilistic, okay? very little deterministic, right? So it's highly probabilistic. Therefore, we've got some weird arbitrary story points, kind of loaded factor stuff going on, you know, to help us with that it's not entirely true and there's more to that story the, before we kind of kick into my story the, the thing i'm going to kind of leave you with you are all highly you wouldn't have got this far in life right you're highly intelligent human beings you will all be able to judge whether something is highly complex easy doable or not right and that is probably the serving purpose of having a estimation uh, technique being able to judge whether something needs decomposing into segmented parts, et cetera, to make it more consumable. OK, I'm going to like park that there for a little bit because I need to I'm kind of conscious of time and I'm kind of like trying to get through the story. OK, so oh, I just went ping. Oh, let's get rid of my emails. Right, let's go. Uh, right. This is called What's the Point? Um, uh, play on words. And it's all about forecasting performance. And um, 
uh, hands up who's never played any kind of sport. Anybody, uh, maybe you've played an obscure sport. Anybody played a really obscure sport? Uh, we have quite a lot. That, like uh, if you go out and about in Bristol, uh, where's where's uh, I find Nikki? Nikki Nikki's from Bristol. Uh, you see people playing weird sports. You know they kind of like weird, weird. Have you ever seen that on Castle Green or like on the Downs where people are playing weird things with balls and uh, trampolines and stuff? Yeah, um, where they often tie up the trees and things and they start jumping around. Bit yeah. random. <laughs> so, so Bristol tends to have a high proportion of people playing obscure sports stuff. Um, uh, uh, anybody here run a half marathon or a full marathon? Anybody done, done some awesomeness? Because I, anybody's done a lot, you know, pushing, pushing the boundary. Any? Oh, okay. So uh, Maru, uh, yep, who's done, uh, has anybody run an ultra? Has anybody done a thing? Okay, Sharon, uh, Sharon, is that an ultra, Sharon? Only 52 kilometers. Yeah, 52 kilometers are above. Constitute. Really impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in it, so, you know, if you've done any kind of sport or anything that has required you to really inspect your performance, you will recognize. Okay, Rob, Rob, I saw, saw a hand from Rob as well. You will recognize the story that I'm going to go through and, and why, why it's important. Because what we're talking about here is measuring time, not predicting time. So, in the UK, um, the UK Special Forces, it's now called the Joint UK Special Forces Selection Process. It is lengthy um, and it involves quite a few things. Um, one of the, um, <laughs> before you even get to, there's, there's a phase called the Hills phase, which effectively uh, puts the candidates through um, a week in, the, in a place called the Bracken Beacons in Wales, um, which is mountainous, uh, bleak, full of sheep, um, uh, very wet, very windy, uh, and very often not sunny. <laughs> uh, and it puts them through a selection of tasks just for that week, and then there's further, further stuff to do. There's a um, one of the one of the events is called the Fan Dance, and it's called the Fan Dance because there's a mountain in South Wales called Penafan or uh, Pen Yi Fan. Uh, if you Welsh, you say you say Van, uh, uh, and you effectively go over that mountain twice. Um, I'll explain the kind of the route and all these kind of things. So you start at this very iconic place. Uh, this is called the Story Arms. And if you're lucky enough to be there uh, very early in January or, sorry, unlucky enough to be there uh, very early in January or very unlucky enough to be there probably about this time of the year, um, you will see um, people with uh, military equipment, um, large backpacks setting off from this point. And it just climbs and climbs and climbs and climbs. Um, the route kind of encompasses pretty much most of this map. It is a very, very long distance. So there's a company in the UK um, run by a bunch of ex-Special Forces guys who are putting on these events for civilians. And obviously, if you're serving military, you can come along and do them as well. And they are based upon um, this uh, on the UK Special Forces selection. Um, and this is the event we're going to talk about. Um, this is the event uh, I've been kind of specializing in for the last few years ex and doing others with them. Um, and this is the route. Um, the route is 24 kilometers and you are carrying 45 pounds, which is somewhere around 20 kilograms. And that includes a bit of water, but you are that is what you're uh, that is what you're you're carrying. You have to be wearing boots, you have to be wearing trousers, everything else is optional. Okay. Uh, you're not allowed rocks. You've got to carry dead weight in terms of water, but you have to fill a Bergen, military Bergen, uh, and you have to achieve this. Now, you can achieve it in any time you wish, but for the Special Forces selection, four hours or less. Um, so, so that's your effort. You're effectively going to climb uh, 3,100 feet, positively or negative, over the course of this race. Believe me, four hours is hard. <laughs> it is very, very hard. So what would you say? Complicated, complex, or chaotic? Where would you stick this as, a, as an event? Depends on you and your preparation. Yeah, and we're going to come into that in a minute. But what would you say? First thoughts, anybody? Complex. Yeah. Yep, it's hard, right? It's not easy. There's nothing. There's nothing simple about that challenge. 
Um, as I said, you're all highly intelligent adults, right? You can all see that's quite a hard thing to go and do. So my first attempt, I had zero training. It kind of goes back to that. Mar uh, I think it was Mario who made the comment, right? Depends on your preparation. I signed up a week before and it was something like late December I signed up and it was due to run very early January. And I was, I, I was, I was fairly fit. I wasn't, I was gym fit. So I was doing a lot of fight training. I was doing uh, uh, boxing and MMA training at the time. So I was kind of like, I was round fit, not endurance fit. So I thought, nah, I'll, I'll just do this, right? You know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, uh, well, what really happened is I died quite, not literally, but, but I just died, right? I went into it and just really, really suffered. Um, uh, there's a there's a very famous part of this route which is called Jacob's Ladder, which effectively is the return uh, is one of the return climbs, and it's like going up a huge flight of stairs with 20 kilograms on your back uh, in a skyscraper um, after you've currently run something like 12 miles. Um, so your legs and your system is already drained of energy, and now you've got to climb this the, the side of this mountain with that weight. So. Um, uh, I did it in five hours 15, right? Which, which I've, I've spoken to some people, they've done it in six, et cetera, you know, uh, you know, it's not a bad effort, but it's not what I wanted, right? So we have to go into some level of inspect and adapt. And here are my lessons. Um, uh, and these are the lessons I would kind of take, you know, if you're looking at uh, Scrum with Kanban, if you're looking at trying to understand better Scrum, um, these lessons can be translated into that. So master the objective, right? Um, master the flow, measure and train hard and execute. I'm going to walk through those. So one thing to kind of bear in mind, um, when we start to talk about doing Kanban with Scrum, Scrum doesn't disappear, right? And Scrum has this great thing called a goal. And so what is your goal? What is your objective? For me, my objective was to kind of smash it out of 515 down to try and hit the sub four, right? That was my goal. That's what I wanted to achieve. When we start to talk about Scrum, ensuring that there is a goal behind every sprint that you do is really important. When you think about personal objectives, what is your goal? What is your objective? Why are you doing what you're doing? Um, by the way, this is me. Uh, this is Jacob's Ladder. This is that climb I was talking about. This is me on a training exercise with my mate, trying to understand how hard it was to do that climb again and again and again and again, right? Um, uh, this is a, this is a yeah, real photo of the top of my bald head <laughs> on the side of that mountain, dying once again, trying to overcome it. Um, but what is your objective? What was driving me up the side of that mountain? What is driving you as your scrum team? What is driving your goal for that sprint? And that's really important. Um, mastery of the flow. And we talk about that a lot in Kanban, right? What is your flow? Uh, this is a this is a picture of part of the event, right? This is the the one of the climbs on the uh, the one of the one of the first climbs you end up doing, and it winds all the way up. Um, but what does your workflow look like? What is your route? Now I've shown you the map a couple of times, um, and I'm going to show it again in a bit. But segmenting the route into uh, uh, decomposable sections. Once we start to measure that, we can then start to understand our performance a little bit better. And we'll come back to that a little bit more. But so what is your goal? What does your workflow look like? You know, mastery. What does mastery of that workflow look like? Um, and train hard, right? Now, when we start to wonder what that means from a Kanban point of view, uh, this is me looking very tired on a training event again. Um, uh, when we start to understand, think about what that means from a Kanban point of view, um, this is how do you actively uh, uh, measure and how do you actively manage that workflow and the work within that workflow? Now, you know, as me, you know, as a runner, um, a lot of this came down to equipment. A lot of this came down to understanding nutrition. A lot of this came down to understanding timings between sections on that on that event. But I had to ma actively manage that and I had to actively try. Um, uh, uh, keep an eye on the measures I was taking and actively keep an eye on my nutrition, et cetera, in to ensure I was using my best performance. When we start to think about how scrum teams and teams using Kanban, the same principles apply. Actively managing the work, work, uh, uh, work in item, uh, work, <laughs> the items in uh, in progress, work for, work for, well, God, my brain's gone. Anyway, the, the, the active work in, uh, work in progress, um, uh, when we start to look at the measures around those items, when we start to actively look at the, the workflow, these are all really, really important elements. 
And the final thing I will say on this one is measure, 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 measure. Now, measures I will come back to, but I started measuring my performance. Now, the thing I will offer out to you is how many people on this call are actively measuring the performance of their team? Not just from a number of story points you're, you're producing, but actively managing the performance. How many things are they are they producing per sprint? How long is it taking you to produce those things? How many things are stuck waiting to get done? And how long have they been stuck? How long have those items been in progress? And we, you, we talk about what those measures mean from a professional scrum and Kanban, but measurement is important. Now, this is a Strava snapshot of one of my training runs. This is actually from the course. And you can see, uh, you know, it goes up and down, up and down. And this slowest bit, right down the bottom, that slowest bit, that is that climb. And I knew every time I hit that climb, it was going to take me a percentage of time. Measurement became incredibly important because when I hit that, that part in the course and when your teams hit a part in your workflow, understanding how long it takes for work to progress either just through that part or your whole workflow can lead you to what we call the SLE it can lead you to a predictability or a predictive measurement that you could say you know we can complete work within eight days or less for me in this race I knew every time I hit the bottom of Jacob's ladder that really hard climb on the data I was gathering it would take me about 20 minutes or less to master that climb so when I hit the bottom of that climb, I could look at my watch and I knew exactly where I was going to be in 20 minutes time. If I'm at the top, I'm doing well, right? If I'm not at the top, I'm behind. And that, that's where I need to pick myself up. So the way I looked at this is I start segmenting the course down into, into sections. Now, if we think about this from a, a, a scrum team's perspective, you could say yellow is, you know, maybe your, uh, you know, your, your red phone box is your to-do and your yellow is your an analysis, your blue is your, you know, development, your black is your testing and your green is released. You know, you could look at it like that. Understand your workflow is really important. I mean, unfortunately for me, I had to do that and then back again. <laughs> so kind of, you know, I needed to know all of the measures for those segments. But from a forecasting performance point of view, it's really, really important. So, Here's my, my lesson, an ultimate lesson. At no point did I think, I wonder how many story points this race is, right? At no point did I ever consider story points and uh, I just knew it was hard. So I knew I had to break it down. Um, so the second attempt, what could possibly go wrong? Um, uh, you know, what's the worst thing you could do? You can uh, run into a tree and blind yourself. Um, this genuinely happened. This happened, um, uh, a week before my second attempt. Um, so what did I do? Well, I just carried on, uh, got 42nd place and uh, completed the event in four hours and 15. So looking at my workflow, looking at the measures, actively taking steps to, to uh, attune my performance in those segments, um, uh, uh, I managed to take an hour off my time. Um, I went on to do some other things where I ruined my knees. It's called point to point. We haven't got time for that story. <laughs> but it's worth noting, I took the same stance when I went in and entered that one as well. Okay, so, so the third attempt, I thought, well, okay, I thought I can do this. And I did something really stupid. Um, I signed up for the double. So you do um, the event in the day and then you do it again at night. Because, um, you know, what could be more crazy and stupid? Um, what I needed to know um, when I was going into that is flow knowledge, constraint knowledge, and, and solid equipment. And again, we're back in that mastering my flow, mastering the measures, understanding and actively managing uh, the information that I was getting throughout my workflow. Um, measure, 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 measure. Um, and this was, again, a, another snapshot of one of the training rungs. Again, very different, but actually my slowest has dropped 10 minutes. So I've managed to shave time off. I'm getting fitter for sure, but my understanding of the route was far, far better. Um, so much so that on this return, on this last dip, on that return, when I got to the top, I knew that it, on average, to some degree, it would take me 30 minutes or less to get down the mountain. On my final attempt to beat the clock to four hours, I had 25 minutes from the last RV, the last check-in point. I knew I had to get 
uh, my legs moving as soon as possible. That was what measurements told me. Now, if you're a team and you're delivering work and your SLE says, we deliver things 85% of the time in eight days or less, and you're looking at something and it's seven days and it's not even ex uh, exited testing or whatever you, one of your last phases are, you're probably in danger of that not achieving your SLE. Therefore, you're probably in danger of not meeting your commitments as a team, which is why, again, measurements and measuring the right things can be incredibly powerful. They can be incredibly powerful as a conversation piece for your team about the workflow and the work you are performing within it. So I knew I had some challenges here and I knew I had to go to, to do well and I knew I had to, to train hard. Um, I knew I had to execute hard. And somebody said to me just before the race, said, well, you know, if you don't make your time, will you fail? Um, and then I start to go, well, what does done mean? Now, when we start to think about what done means for our teams, what it done mean for me as a race? Well, done meant for me as a, as a, uh, in the race, actually done meant not turning up and delivering and not doing it. Okay, It didn't mean not making the time. Done meant not showing up, too scared not to do it. But what does done mean for your teams? How can you utilize workflow and done? Now, the way I teach um, workflow with done is that every uh, activity through your workflow has an executionable step in order for it to meet the, the criteria for the next work, uh, activity in the workflow. So as you go through and as work transitions, you start to build up a pattern of done. So what does it mean for work to be able to transition from development to testing perhaps? Does that mean it has to be checked in? Does it mean the unit tests have to be run? Does it mean it has to be pair programmed? Uh, sorry, uh, peer reviewed? Does it mean you've done pairing, et cetera? Well, they're done criteria, right? So in order for work to exit from, from development to done, actually we should have satisfied that criteria. In my race, for me to transition from one segment to another, I had to check in with the, the directing staff. So I had criteria of my own. Am I okay? Am I capable? Am I still conscious? <laughs> you know, am I not blind? You know, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, guess what? I blinded myself a week before the second, the third race. I blinded myself a week before the third race. And again, I ran, I ran with a, bl a half blind. I woke up that morning um, and I couldn't see out that, that eye. Um, and I still ran with that eye because I, again, I was committed. I had to do it. So again, train hard. Everyone understands the flow and the principles required to achieve performance. And this is really, really capturing it all. If you're working as a team, it's not just for the scrum master to understand Kanban. It's not for the scrum master just to understand workflow, workflow definition, the metrics. Everybody has to understand what it means to perform as a team. And that's really imperative because if you're the only one saying, come on, you know, we've got eight, you know, eight days or less, eight days or less, nobody's going to care. Like nobody's going to care. It was important for me in the race. I I was the one doing the race. So I had to understand my performance in which to execute to my standards. I wanted to beat sub four. You know, the directing staff and the people putting on it didn't care whether I hit sub four or not, right? That wasn't their thing. Your stakeholders are going to care if you are not performing though. This, your stakeholders are going to start saying, where's my stuff? And if you don't have the measures in place and the team aren't committed enough, you're not going to be able to uh, be able to convey the importance around why you know hitting our performance is Im important to the stakeholder and to themselves right do you want to be a great team or do you want to be performing as a uh, as an amazing team so training hard right and helping everyone understand the workflow digging into that workflow looking at the principles of done what does it mean to achieve done looking at the um uh, the policies around what does it mean for work to flow from activity to activity etc cetera, etc cetera. um uh, and that's 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 a picture of me and one of my best mates uh uh out training again um when i had time <laughs> when i had time and we weren't locked down um uh, let me uh, actively managing the work yeah so i was kind of trying to translate train hard into actively managing the work in progress and this is what we mean so um the third attempt uh 347 so I'd taken half an hour or less than half an hour. I'd beaten the four hours um, and I got, I was 24th. So I'd managed to go way, way up the field. Um, I was one of the first few people to hit the first RV, the rendezvous point at the top of the mountain. Um, I left my good friend 
who until that point in time had been absolutely killing me uh, in terms of the race. And we got to the top and I was ahead of him and all I heard him shout was, what the hell are you doing in front of me? <laughs> so, you know, I'd done something well. Um, I genuinely put a lot of it down to the measurement side of things, actually truly understanding my workflow and what it was going to take and how long it would take me to get from section to section. It was an absolute game changer. So cool story, bro. But what does this mean? Right. So master the objective, master the flow, measure and train hard. I've talked a lot kind of in terms of what measurements meant to mean these are the kanban measures we use right so throughput is a number of items that you achieve within a sprint now i've underlined cycle time because this is probably the most pertinent to this story um cycle time is our understanding of how long it takes for an item to get from where work is uh, uh, deemed to have uh, started and where it is deemed to have been complete or in scrum terms, it's kind of like your sprint backlog through to done, or you could expand that, right? The, the, workflow, um, uh, the workflow definition is entirely up to you. However, done should mean done, okay? No further work. So your cycle time is a measured time between, between those states. Work in progress, we should, all, we should all understand and keep an eye on that, right? How many things are you working on at any one time? That has a direct impact on your cycle time. Um, now, if you come on the Professional Scrum of Kanban course, we will dig into that and show and demonstrate how that impact um, is actually perceived and how you can measure that and do things about it. Um, and the final one, which is a lovely one, um, which probably bears, uh, no, it pro I could probably bear some relevance to this, is age. Age is our hidden uh, factor that, that I guess a lot of people pay attention to, but they don't know what to do with. So when I was starting my Scrum Mastery journey, I remember thinking these things have been in, in progress for a long, long time. And, and maybe other people are sitting there going, yeah, yeah, that's been in progress for a long, long time. But you don't know quite what to do with that information. Now, age is only really, really, really useful right, as a metric when you have cycle time. Because once you know how long something is proposing to take, you know, eight days or less, then you start to add age to that. You've now got comparative measures and we can now balance the two. So if something, if your SLE, if your cycle time is, uh, is eight days or less and something is taking seven, eight, nine days, right, you're exceeding that. So you can have a really good conversation. If I'm running a race and I'm hitting an RV late, I've got something to do, I've got some work to do, right? Age pay, plays an absolute um, part in not just my physical activities, but actually in the work as well. Um, and here you go, I don't know why I put this in. Oh, here you go, it's kind of like comparative measures, right? So, so you know, on the top, I could see graphically, I could inspect, I could adapt, I could have a conversation about this. What this looks like in, in our world, well, this is a cycle time scatter plot. This is one of the metrics, uh, sorry, this is one of the charts we talk about in the Professional Scrum and Kanban course. We talk about how to interpret this, how to create this, how to derive those SLEs. So you've heard me talk about this thing called a service level expectation or an SLE. How do we actually calculate that? How do we calculate that without providing an average? And we haven't got time on this webcast to talk about the floor of averages, but we will absolutely talk about it in the class. But you could, in your own time, go and have a look at the floor of averages. Go and have a look at the videos on YouTube. They're really quite interesting. Um, but we use cycle time scatter plots in order to help us derive that SLE, in order to help us understand how long work takes. And this is the you know, perceived output, OK? Now, in real life, um, I've done some other really cool things around throughput and predictability and forecasting. Um, looking at uh, degrees of variance in terms of team performance. Um, working with fixed dates, which is basically this graph here, is a, a, an example of working with uncertain, uh, uncertain output, uncertain um, delivery to achieving done, high degree of variance um, with a fixed date. Right, and that's, that's what most people in, uh, in agility try and avoid. Um, I didn't have a choice, so I had to do some really cool stuff. Um, but user, using cycle time, using throughput, and this is based upon throughput with a degree of variance, um, managing to track and actively have a conversation. All of the things we've talked about, the metrics, the measures, the charts, are tools for conversation. Um, they, whether they are correct or not, right? they are a tool for conversation. And the conversation is the powerful part. And this is what we want to be having with our stakeholders, irrespective 
of whether the information is 100% accurate or not. We want to be saying, look, we are here. Right? We have an increment or we don't. We, we are predicted to be here or we're not. You are going to get X things or you're not. And setting that expectation early and often will help you. Waiting to the very end to deliver a, uh, a conversation with your stakeholders about what you're not going to achieve is going to only lead to frustration. So when we talk about professional scrum with Kanban, we introduce more conversational techniques and more conversational tools that allow you to have far better and um, uh, uh, far better uh, conversations with your stakeholders and your team in order to understand performance. Um, this is the uh, uh, <laughs> this is the cell bit. Do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I just I just shared the right. You can see the tippy scale slide, right? Yep. Yeah, because I thought that might be. I, I just saw with the fonts and all uh, that was going to be messed up. So, yeah. So this is we're going to do a professional scrum with Kanban training 16th and 17th of September, which is going to be a live virtual class, which means it's going to be about the setting, just less people. Um, and uh, we're going to do a lot of um, uh, workshop based things also and share a lot more information about how you can combine Scrum with Kanban in a good way, you know, and, and, and maybe also to convince or show, make transparent to your team members, uh, as Andy said, how important that is, uh, why that is important. So why these measurements are important, why these things should be transparent and how the team can be more successful um you know and content with with the use of scrum and being a a professional scrum team using kanban metrics so if you want to join of course you're welcome to and you can check our website yeah. to see more information should i just go through the next slide which is yeah yeah, yeah. I, just to, I just want to add to that it is um uh it is <laughs> don't tell everybody else but it is my favorite course <laughs> i don't i don't i'm not one of those people who go around oh, this is my favorite course no it is like genuinely my favorite course as you can tell i'm kind of highly passionate about it i get really quite excited because for me as a for me in my journey as a scrum master in my my journey understanding and trying to forecast performance this uh, and time and time again when i've trained and coached uh, Scrum Masters uh, that I've worked with and, uh, um, and others, um, it is an absolute game changer for you in your tool set as a Scrum Master. Uh, there is no doubt about that. It is, it is absolutely fantastic, really, really good fun as well. Um, sorry, go, go last, last two or three slides. Um, it is me just saying, you know, just remember, next slide. Um, at no point did I think, I wonder how many story points this is, right? And that's it, you know, and neither should you. <laughs> So, so you know, it's just oh, this is this is pictures. Of, this is me on the first RV uh, and um, checking in for the first time, uh, looking highly stressed. And then this is me at the end with one of these uh, one of those <laughs> guys. So uh, it's me. I, I think he said, "Welcome to the welcome to the sub four club." That was what he said to me when I when I got my patch. So, um, so yeah. Um, so that's my little story about forecasting performance. Um, uh, hopefully, it's given you a little bit of insight about. You know, or, or challenge maybe you're thinking about, well, what are story points for? What can we actually use them for? And, and, uh, and you know, what's this Kanban thing? Maybe we ought to dig into that. Um, have we got time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, there's actually one in the chat that's still unanswered. It's a question from Marcel. He says, I understand and, uh, the analyzing and the worth of it, uh, but you were basically doing the same sprint several times where most teams only do each sprint once, right? So how does, uh, does that compare in your eyes? So this was the question from Marcel. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess what you're saying is the event in its own right was a, was a kind of once, you know, thing. Um, I was looking at the, uh, when, I, when I was talking about the workflow, I was looking at the course route. So breaking the course route down into a factor that I had to go and achieve. So I could go and run that event anytime I want. I don't have to wait for them to put it on. Um, I could go and run any section of that event anytime I wish. And understanding how long it takes for work, you know, or me to flow through any part of that system or the system as a whole, you know, is quite useful. Um, and this is where it translates into, into Scrum Teams, understanding your workflow, whether you're executing the same race you know whether you're executing the same work which you're probably not 
every time is immaterial. The fact you're probably utilizing the same people, the same process in order to execute that work. And that's what we're talking about. And that's what we mean by workflow. Yeah, so so following up on that, Benjamin has a like a question like for measuring throughput, you need some sort of you know quantifying unit. I think that's what you were just talking about as well, right? Yeah, I mean, th throughput is just a measure of, um, uh, now let's be clear, okay? All of these measures, are useless if you're not producing things that are done. Because you're effectively measuring work that is undone. You can't, that's not measurable, right? You can't say, you can't say, well, next time we, we go to create undone work, it's going to look the same. So you have to be measuring work that is complete, that is potentially releasable, that you feel is done, and whatever done means to you in your organization. So throughput is just a measure of number of done things per unit of time. That is it very simply as a definition. Um, the, the graph I, was, I had on that slide deck, which had the, uh, I guess, the expanding arrows with the degree of variance, all I was doing was I was going into the, the, the team's JIRA and saying, okay, how many, how many items of value are they completing per sprint? Okay, what does that look like as a number? Okay, right, so how many things, and this is the floor of averages, and I'm not um advocating the way i did it as a very good way there are there are tools that we introduce you to on the class <laughs> that that slide right this was me trying to understand i was put in a position from an organization um to go and hit a date they said we got to we got to we got to release on the 23rd of jan so i want to know whether uh, i'm going to air quote i don't often air quote but mvp I, I'm gonna, I want to know whether the mvp will be complete so the mvp was a baseline number of items in a product backlog so we had to achieve, you know, a, num a number by a date, right? Which meant you couldn't flex scope, right? So it was, what are we going to go and achieve? What this led to was me looking at the, the throughput and doing some very bad things with Excel. But the great thing that came out of it, whether it was incorrect or not, it forced a conversation. And that first initial spike was <laughs> when... When we turned around to the product owner and said, you're not going to get all your stuff, they went, ah, we need to refine the backlog, which is good, right? But what they discovered was all of the stuff they had not refined was actually not that big. It was that big, right? So they then uncovered a whole load of backlog complexity. Whether the data was correct or not, we could instantly see we've got a larger task ahead of us. Tool for a conversation. So as we're progressing, we're now starting to think, okay, we need to trim that backlog down to really truly understand what MVP really meant based upon our performance. And our performance was projecting a very much lower number than, than the MVP was suggesting we had to go and achieve. Yeah, so, and then we got a question about how the calculation of business value, and if, if I may, you know, there's, there is something very important to note here is that everything that goes through your system, we see as that's in the definition of Scrum with Kanban, right? Is per definition value. So we're not just putting tasks through that don't deliver value. Something that is done delivers value. Um, and when you start delivering that value more and more often, um, you will get less of the discussion of how do we, how do we like, what is, what is value for us and how do we measure that kind of value? And so, when you start really, and again, you're gonna have a conversation about that, right? So uh, it's gonna lead value through your system and you're gonna have a discussion on how to prior or, or how to order your value on your backlog, on your product backlog at first, which then goes through your system. Uh, and you'll have a discussion on how, you know, how predictable are we in delivering this value? So it's very important to know that what we deliver is value. And it's not just work, right? It's not just output. Um, it's output that delivers value. Yeah, and and beware of the value trap once it's in progress. So so constantly switching attention to value is going to lead for things to get older and older. So if you let's say you have something already in progress, or something comes in that you you perceive as higher value, you switch your focus over to that. You don't know how long that thing's going to take, and you've already spent time on the the previous item. And that's the value trap. So you're constantly switching over to the highest value, highest value, highest value item. Actually, what you should be doing is trying to focus on the thing that has been in progress the longest and get rid of that first. 
then you can focus on the next biggest value because if you're constantly switching all of them you're right, you're falling into the whip trap and the value and the uh, and the age trap and the value trap and everything's going to go wrong yeah. so yeah. something to be aware of there and then and then the interesting question about sizing right so benjamin says like every uh, done items should be, you know, number of done items will be only useful items uh, if they're relative of, of size. If they're, you know, if they're varying size, then, you know, you should slice them or, you know, it's it's not going to be good for predictability. So how do you feel about that? So, so, uh, the, 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 number, the, the uh, what do you, how, how do you call that? The, the number, the, do you mean like decomposition down into growth in number? Is that where you're kind of going? Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, uh, size really doesn't matter. Um, size, size. How you act on work, uh, uh, I guess, impacts how long something takes far more than size. Yes, there are probably there. There is a factor of size, right? There absolutely is. But once a team's brought it into the flow size is no longer a consideration you're now working against the clock right you're now starting to look at okay is the thing that we're doing going to be within our sle and actually once you have your sle even better if upstream and plan planning and refinement you've got something right so your sle takes eight days we don't need to story point it we don't need to size it is this thing that Jasper's now asking us to go and do can we get that done in eight days or less yes or no okay no then we need to decompose that maybe into some more valuable items is it going to break our sle potentially we can't decompose it okay so we're then going to have to inform our stakeholders that this thing is going to break our sle and the final thing i'll say on size is um and we in the class we can demonstrate this quite easily but but the more people you put onto an item i mean potentially you've got the complexity factor but we see it time and time again where um, something that, that is perceived to be really, really hard to achieve, and you put the right people on it, and maybe more people go and swarm on solving that problem, um, that thing just gets done. Right? It gets done far quicker than anything else in the workflow, because all you're doing is you're reducing, you're implicitly, um, and, and, without, and without thinking, you're implicitly uh, limiting your work in progress. Because all of the focus of the team is on that one thing. Everybody's trying to get that one big horrible thing through the pipe and out and done. The more things you have in progress, the longer things will take. Uh, this is Little's Law coming into play. Size will play a part, but also how you treat work. And this is the actively managing work, work, work items in progress. That's the thing I've been trying to say for the last half an hour. Or so. <laughs> Bit of a mouthful, that one. Um, uh, but actively managing how you treat work um it, it will will uh, i guess pay you dividends more than trying to uh, trying to right size every item you're all highly intelligent people you're all highly intelligent people and your developers and your teams are they can judge quite genuinely whether something will fit within an sle or be achievable or not and and let them do it so i'm gonna just quickly share uh, a link to slack in the chat uh, so if you, because if you would like to join in on the conversation, on this conversation or another conversation, sometimes, you know, I had a, a thing the other day as a Scrum Master of, of a couple of teams, I'm you know, often uh, thrown into things that I think like, oh, well, how should I resolve this? And how do other Scrum Masters go about this? Then I just put it in our Slack community and I get all kinds of responses from other Scrum Masters saying, hey, you should try this or if you try that. So. If you want that as well, you can join us uh, in the Slack community. That's the place to be. Well, not just, it's a good place to be. So are there any further things, questions or remarks then? You can put them in, in the chat or of course, join us in Slack later. It's all silence. Well, I well, think I did if, or did you have something else you want to share? No, I was just going to say thank you for everyone for listening. Um, when's the, oh, great one. Uh, when's the best time to start doing Kanban? Now. <laughs> uh, go, and read, go and read the Professional Scrum and Kanban guide. Um, go and have a look at the intent. Right? And you might find it's, a, it's very much um, 
uh theory theory wordy i mean it's it, it doesn't bear it's got it, it hints at practical application um uh go and check out um if we can put a link to dan vacanti uh go and check out dan vacanti on youtube um he does a series called drunk agile um go and check out uh, his youtube channel which is really good um so dan vacanti was one of the uh, creators of kanban um he was also uh, one of the people who brought uh, Kanban into Scrum.org, um, one of the co-creators of the professional Scrum with Kanban course and, and the guide. So uh, do check out Dan Bacanti, um and his book and all those other things. Um, uh, but yeah, go and check him out. Um, and uh, just for me, just thank you for listening to my story. Um, uh, you know, and do come on, you know, I, I'd love to see you on the course. Um, it's a great course. I do love running it. Um, and I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to doing it again. Thanks a lot, Andy, for sharing your story with us. And uh, I think it's a great, it's of great value and it, it represents a great part of how we go about in this course from Scrum with Kanban. And, um, and, you know, it's not, it's it's difficult to do Scrum with Kanban. It's difficult to do Scrum. Uh, it's difficult to do Kanban and both. Uh, but, you know, try to avoid the discussion that, you know, you, you need either one. Uh, because they are far more valuable together and they are so, you know, they are so pow so, so powerful combined. And you will find all about that uh, if, you, if you join us in this class, but otherwise you can read it, you know, read the Kanban guide, uh, the Kanban, uh, as well as Kanban guide and all the resources that are available. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon to give a little bit of your time uh, to uh, to listen to the story of Andy and uh, to to the story of you know how, how you well, why you should measure basically and uh, how important that is and um, well we'll see you in another in another place in another time hopefully sometime next year physically as well maybe some conference or you know whatever not will be great uh, stay safe and um, stay connected and see you next time.